Hello everybody and welcome to CS202 Online. Hope you all are having a good day today. So today we're going to keep talking about virtuals. And so in specific we are going to talk about abstract classes and how those are achieved with virtual functions and interfaces. In whatever we can call an interface in C++. Then I also want to throw in what the disk pointer is. It's just something that we kind of just would throw at some point. So I thought I'd bring it up today just to not forget. And then from there, we are going to show you some examples of how virtuals can be very, very useful. Uh, and also show you some special cases about virtual destructors and virtual inheritance. And hopefully we get everything today. But if not, then we'll put those two at the next class. I do want to test something here that I set up. Uh, I wanted to do this full screen. Let's see what happens. So, hmm, interesting. Okay, so I gotta I gotta change that for my background to be white or something because this could be cool for like writing directly here. But uh, okay, that didn't work out as expected. So I shall keep testing on that later. Because it could be cool that I could like write up there, you know. I think I have to. Yeah, I think I know how I'll do that. But anyways. All right, so let us go ahead and pick off where we left off last class, which was talking about up and down casting. And as a quick reminder about that, up casting is casting a child pointer. So or basically a pointer, you know, of a class that is a derived class and casting that to the parent or super class and we're doing that on a pointer level so like the pointer that's holding you know that's pointing to the object we're changing that pointer and so that's what we consider casting down casting is when we have a pointer that is of a, of a parent or super class and you know in this case we are casting it down to a pointer of a derived class that's inherited from that and we only really want to do this if what we're really pointing to is actually a derived object, right? So if the pointer is of the, of the super class and it's already pointing to an object of a derived class, then it's okay to change that pointer down to the derived type of pointer. And we can only achieve that down casting because it's very dangerous. We can only achieve it using dynamic cast. And dynamic cast is going to be the type of casting that does some checks at, at runtime and, and ensures that that is safe to do because the object is really of the derived class type. And if not, then when you do the dynamic cast, we saw that it actually returns a zero as the address instead of the actual, the same address, but of a different type, right? And so that is by design to allow us to do some kind of error checking to see if the downcast that we're doing is safe or if it's not, okay? So that's up and down casting. And what we'll do today is we're going to show you a, a cool usage of that, uh, that that kind of covers what polymorphism is. And in general, you kind of see like everything, all the pieces come together. But before that, I would like to, to bring your attention to another usage of virtual that's very important, which is also going to come into play when we talk about that big example, okay? And so let me go ahead and write a class called A that has a integer X, whatever, that's fine. And then we have a class B that derives from class A. Okay. And let's maybe give this example some meaning. So normally I do animals, but I'm trying to think of something else right now that we can use. So let's talk about computer brands. Yeah, why not? So let's say that class A is, instead we're going to say it was a class computer. So this is a computer class, okay? And that computer class, what it represents is a computer, like just a computer. But we're going to derive that class and we're going to create different computers that are sort of, sort of under that chain. So for example, we could have like PC, like a personal computer that is going to derive from the computer class. We can also have 
like a phone, for example, a smartphone. So we'll call this like, yeah, smartphone, why not? And that derives also from computer. And maybe we have, um, what's another computer you guys could think of? Smartwatch, we could do smartwatch. Anybody have another one? Here, I'll leave this open for the chat to say. But in the meantime, I'm gonna say that all computers have a brand or a name associated to them. And so we're going to create a string called, we'll call it name, but it's really more of the brand, okay? But I don't wanna say the word brand because it kind of limits us to what we can do. And we are gonna make sure we put public in here and we are going to have a function that, in fact, we don't need to make the, the, the name public. We can actually keep that private, but we're gonna write a function. Um, we'll make it protected, just, just in case we need to modify it. Okay, but we're gonna write a function that is going to uh, get us that name because it's not public. So it's gonna call get name and it's just going to return name, okay? Or, in, yeah, we could just see out the name, but I guess we'll, we'll write both. We'll write a function that gets the name and maybe one that returns the name. Mm. Yeah, we'll leave it like that for now, okay? So uh, nobody said on the chat anything. So I guess I will go ahead and do smartphone since nobody had an opinion about it okay and so all computers were saying have a name they could have other shared things that a computer has such as like the name of the processor which we're gonna say all computers have some sort of processor or central processing unit and uh, they could also have maybe the electricity required to run like number of, like like how much power you know how many amps or whatnot but uh, we're just gonna use the name is the one thing they share in common, just to keep the code short. Now, PC is going to have, in addition to being a computer, you know, what would a, would, would a personal computer have that maybe just a generic computer wouldn't have? Well, in this case, looking at this, I am going to say graphics card. So we're gonna create a name called GFX, and that is going to be the name of the graphics card, okay? Uh, also, one thing that would be nice to have shared among them is to find out what kind of computer they are. So we could make a string function that uh, prints out what the computer is, right? If it's a PC, a smartphone, or a smartwatch. No, I put smartphone twice. Smartwatch. Okay. And so we can go ahead and say something like get type okay get the type of the computer essentially and what this is going to do is it's basically just going to see out what it is which in this case is just a computer okay but in this scenario here we want that same function not to print out that it's a computer but in this case to print out that it's a pc and then for this one, we wanted to print out that it's a smartwatch or smartphone. And this one to be that it's a smartwatch, okay? Uh, just so we don't run out of space here, I'm going to uh, put them all in the same line like that. That will conserve some space. So we don't have to keep scrolling up and down. Okay, so now, um, you know, we could add, like, for example, what does a smartphone have that uh, a PC would not have or a smartwatch would not have? A uh, touchscreen. Well, smartwatch could also have a touchscreen, but whatever. We'll just put, uh, or how about speakers? Because uh, smartwatches don't normally have active speak. Well, they might, actually. I don't know what the modern one smartwatches might have. Um, how about just phone call capabilities? Because most smartwatches, like, they can call, but they need to connect to an Android phone, right? So... We'll say a uh, phone, uh, how about a carrier? That's a good one, carrier, okay? So the carrier that the smartphone is connected to. As for the smartwatch, we are gonna go ahead and say that the one feature it has 
is a pointer. Yeah, why not? To a smartphone. Which is the one that's connected to, like Bluetooth or something. Okay? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, now, they could also share things. Like, we could have made this be like a nested inheritance. Like, you know, we could say that uh, mobile device could be the shared cross between these that has the touchscreen capabilities. We could have done that. But we're keeping it not that in, into complicated, okay? Because otherwise, uh, we kind of defeat what I'm trying to show you, which is, you know, different related to that. Okay, so we have a, a basic object-oriented design approach here at explaining these different types of computers, right? Cool. Now, let me uh, go ahead and uh, declare a couple of these objects just to see them in action. So maybe we can make a PC, and we'll call this a uh, desktop. And there you go, we made a desktop. So now we can go ahead and say the desktop's GFX is going to be EVGA, because I like them. Not, not to sponsor them, but I like them, okay? Um, we can go ahead and identify that this is a PC by going ahead and, and nearly calling the desktop get type function, right? Like that, okay? In fact, you know what? In addition to C outing, what it is, I'm gonna have it return it too, because that will be useful for us in a little bit. Uh, first of all, I, I want you to notice something about this that I have to update every single one of them. You might say, well, what's the whole point of inheritance if I have to do this? Well, that's because I'm overriding the function and that requires me to rewrite the function. If I wasn't overriding it, I wouldn't have no problem. Get name works for all of them. If I just need to update this one, then it's good to go. But I have to fix the other ones. So now we're gonna say return PC for that one. And we're gonna say return computer for that one. Return smartphone for that one. And finally, this one, return smartwatch. Okay, so we can do a PC, and then maybe let's do let's do a, a, a watch. Um, no, I know we'll do a phone and a watch, so we can show the pointer in action. So, for the for the for the smartphone, we will say smartphone uh, pixel. Okay, or iPhone, whatever. Don't want to piss off one crowd but uh, and then we can just again save space I'm gonna squish things together here let's say pixel dot uh, carrier is going to be Verizon okay and that's it this desktop get type is going to also return to us a type so I'm gonna see out that although the functions already see out it so yeah 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 there's a reason I did the return thing, but that will come into play later, okay? Uh, we can do the same thing for this, though. We can say uh, pixel dot get type. Um, also, none of these are currently updating the name or setting the name to anything. So it might be a good idea to create a constructor that goes ahead and does this. So why don't we go ahead and do that? So we're going to say class computer is going to have a constructor that is going to say computer string s equal to none as a default. And then we are going to initialize the name to be this s variable. And that's pretty much it. Okay. That is a constructor right there. Yeah. And then what we're going to do is these other classes in their own constructor are going to call the parent classes constructor. So PC is going to also have the same concept here, except in this scenario, it is going to call computer constructor and pass it the S parameter as required. Um, and then that's pretty much it for this class. And that is pretty much Oh, what what happened? Oh, I made it full screen. Give me one second. How do I make it not full screen?
I don't know how to not make a post script. What the heck? Um, give me one second. Stand by me. Let me mess around with this for a second here. I gotta, I gotta maximize the main screen of the VM. Alt keys don't work, so I can't quit the full screen. There we go. Okay, it came back. Come on, it's not letting me. I'm just going to close this and reopen it. Okay. that up so there and you can see that and then you can see that okay we're back okay so yeah since I'm running the the VM um, in a very special way to so be able to stream it it became full screen and I could not access the the little icons to make it less than full screen and the alt keys were not working for me to use shortcuts so it's forced to like force close this to the terminal. So, okay. So anyways, uh, we were updating the constructor so that they can initialize the name parameter. So we just need to do a couple of more and we'll be good to go. So we got to do smartphone. And then we got to do smartwatch. Okay, so that's it. I think we got pretty much everything there. Now the code is already too big, so I'm gonna have to keep finding ways of squishing it. So, yeah. Okay, so now let me try to compile it and see if I have any issues. So let's see, no matching function to PC desktop, uh, line 30. Hmm. PC, PC. Oh, did I not put the equal sign? Ah, uh, yes. I have to put in the default parameter for these as well, unless I pass in the name, which I could, but I would like to make this code more flexible for reasons that will become apparent later. So that is why I'm setting up the constructors to allow us to not pass anything, okay? But we could in theory, even though that is a fix that I did there, I'm still gonna pass a name. We're gonna call this uh, computer uh, HP. And then the pixel we can call um, I suppose we can call it pixel. So yeah, okay, so now let's see where we stand here. Okay, we got everything running now, so we can go ahead and execute it, and we just see the words PC and smartphone come out because that's what we're printing here, okay? Uh, so now, let's go ahead and just make the watch now. 
So we're going to make a, a smartwatch. Um, what's what's a smartwatch? I think there's like the iWatch. The I, I, iWatch, is that what it's called? The Apple one? So we'll call it an iWatch. And what we're going to do for the iWatch is we are going to set the phone pointer to point to the address of the pixel like that okay and that's pretty good I mean um, what we can do here is we can run a function so that it's interesting called um, uh, void c parent which c out uh, linked to and then it prints out the phone dot or arrow name okay yeah that's good that way we can see if this works we can say i'll put in the same line again because i don't want to run out of space but we can say like i watch dot c parent and if this is okay which it will be just i want to add an line also then we should be able to see that it's linked to the pixel uh, string name is protected where am i trying to access the name ah here phone name so instead of using name i can go ahead and return get name got so there we go we are linked well it misspelled but it's there you go linked to pixel so that means that watch is indeed linked to pixel which is good okay so here's a here's the situation where uh this is this this is a, there's a problem in this code okay and here's the thing the reason that you made the computer class is not necessarily because there exists a device that's just called computer you made the computer class because it's a class that has shared attributes amongst all of the other classes and the reason that you're putting those attributes in the computer class is so you don't have to basically copy paste code right for example all of the computers here are going to have a name function right and they're also going to have this sort of shared get type function that by putting it here you're sort of creating a template for not template in the center c++ but just a template in general that basically requires all functions to define what get type is for each thing, which is a PC, a smartphone, a smartwatch, and so on, right? So the computer class serves as this sort of overarching class. However, right now, I can very easily create an object of computer and call it computer C, right? And that's a problem because you may not want to have a computer class be able to make an object of that because there is no such thing as a computer there's a smartwatch there's a smartphone there's a PC but there's not just a generic computer okay so we want to have this generic class that sort of overarches the other classes but we don't necessarily want people to make objects of that class the other example that I usually give if you go watch the summer lectures is I give the example of the animals. So you, you re rewrite this code in the fact that the class computer is now called class animal and the class PC is a duck, smartphone is a chicken and smartwatch is a cow. So you and you have a farm and in this farm you can have cows, dogs and pigs, but you don't just have animals. Like what is that? What is an animal? An animal is just an overarching name for the different creatures in your farm but there is no such thing as an animal there's a duck they all have to be specific classes that you've identified as such okay so the same thing here with computer there is no such thing as just a computer it's that's just too generic of a term because it's you're just if you only have that class for the purposes of not having to rewrite code it is only there to save you from doing work and it's sort of like an internal class but it's not a class that you want the end user who's using your computer class library to, to actually declare an object of because it's not very complete. So what I'm about to show you is how you can turn a class into what is known as an abstract class. An abstract class is a class that you can't instantiate an object out of. 
It is kind of like an incomplete class. And because it's incomplete, if you try to declare an object of that class, you will get a compile error, which is a good thing because you don't want them to make objects of these sort of abstract classes that are only meant there to kind of help build other classes. And so the way we achieve that is, what are we talking about? What were we talking about last class and pretty much on the to-do list is virtuals. So virtual is how we're going to achieve that. So what we need to do is we need to write a virtual function inside of the class that we would like to convert into abstract and that's pretty much it. However, we want to make it a pure virtual function. So what is a pure virtual function? I'll show you. So in this case, there is no such thing as a computer. So what we're going to do is we are going to convert this function called get type into a pure virtual function. It doesn't really matter where we put virtual. I think it'll work in either here or there. And that is the syntax with an equal zero. This right here, this syntax of writing the keyword virtual along with the return type and the function name and the parameters, and then putting equal zero in front after it, semicolon, is what is known as a pure virtual function. A pure virtual function will now give us an error if we try to compile this code and will tell us that we cannot declare an object of, 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 of computer type because it is abstract. And further information about why it's abstract is because we have a pure virtual function within that class, which is pointed out right here. This is good because we don't want them to make a computer class. We don't want them to make a generic animal class. We want them to make the end layer of the tree of classes. So like normally think of it like a phylogeny tree in nature, you know, uh, in fact, I could probably pull up one here. Let me see. Phylogeny tree of nature. Uh, phylogeny tree of life. Oh, okay. That sounds interesting. So, uh, this one's cool, but let's see. Uh, I'm trying to look for one that's a little bit nicer to read and show. Oh, this one looks cool. Uh, this one. This one's cool, but it's super tiny. That's unfortunate. Uh, how about this? Let's just animal kingdom tree. I hope I don't get that <laughs> the tree from Disneyland. <laughs> and I did. That's great. Phylogeny okay. tree. Animal kingdom phylogeny tree. Here we go. Okay. So. Um, I was hoping to find something better, but I guess we'll go with something like this. Okay, so let me open up this one. New uh, image. Oh. Right here, let me put that over. Okay, so there we go. Okay, can you all see that? Yeah, okay, perfect. So. This is a phylogeny tree, not the best one that I could find, unfortunately, but basically we have an overarching sort of shared common ancestor per se, I suppose. Um, and that's just that everything is coming from, from these multicellular, uh, uh, basically uh, organisms, right? So the, the animal section of the kingdom of different species and stuff is that animals are multicellular right there's also bacteria and like prokaryote eukaryotes and that kind of stuff fungi that's i think that's its own part of the tree but this is multicellular so anything going down from this is multicellular right so you if you're writing this as a class then you're going to have this be your your member variable related to this now from there there's two divisions there's ones that have no true tissue and they have true tissue so tissue would be the next layer of class that you would make. You made two classes, no true tissue and then tissue. From there, you would inherit that again to whether the kind of symmetry they have, right? So that could actually just be shared in, in, in the way you're implementing this by just putting a variable called symmetry, right? And same, probably with body cavity as well. But when you go into the more sort of specific kind of things here, then, then these might be different classes, right? And ultimately, what you want 
the user of your animal kingdom program to do is to create objects of the bottom classes right here these ones that's the ones that you want him to create objects of you don't want him to create an object of this because this is not a real living animal thing i mean there might have been a common ancestor that at some point was here and then like split off into two but it no longer really exists so you're only making of the species not even the the, the genus but the species that's what you want to make actual objects off because these are the actual animals that exist everything else is meant to split things and to simplify your development of these and classes right but you don't want them to make objects of those classes because there's no such animal as that okay so that's nature for you and it turns out that it is a pretty good idea when doing object oriented programming to try to mimic that nature and so that is what we just achieved with abstract classes now we can't make a computer object. It is going to give us an error. So we take that away and we are good to go. Furthermore, suppose that we were making one more class. We're going to make laptop class, okay? Or tablet. So if we're making tablet class, okay, we are inheriting from computer. It's public inheritance. We put in our constructor so that we initialize, otherwise we're gonna run into problems when we're running the code. So our constructor is just basically passing in the name where you're initializing the name variable in the parent class to be. And we're gonna say that tablets have, um, I don't know, the Apple Pencil or whatever. So string, um, I don't know whatever we'll call it some variable some variable x doesn't matter okay but that's all you make right and this is bad but i'm going to show you we get an error well actually we got a different error for, for a related reason for that semicolon not the error that i was expecting but uh it compiles and it runs so you might actually be thinking oh okay this class is good to go but let's try to make an object of the class let's try to make a tablet t Call it, or I guess we'll call it iPad, okay? Guess what's gonna happen now? We're gonna get the same error as before, except this time we're getting it on, on the iPad class and not on the computer class, which you'd be like, but why? You were saying it's abstract. And why is it abstract? It turns out that there's still the pure virtual function. So here's the thing. An abstract class that is derived doesn't magically become not abstract. You have to remove the parts that were abs that made it abstract to make it into like a normal class. The reason that this class is abstract up here is because we have an abstract uh, pure virtual function, which is the uh, where's the class? Oh, we gotta scroll up. Is this one right here? Get type equals zero. So what I need to do now is I need to actually define that function by overriding the function with a fully created function which means there has to be curly brackets in there to be able to to make this work if i don't do that that class is is being that function is being inherited as part of the inheritance and you're still getting a pure virtual function so it's kind of like like you know you don't see it but the, what the compiler is doing is it's putting that in there just like that which makes it still virtual so what i need to do is i need to actually define this function by putting a body to the function and then I guess in this case put so that it returns something so in this case we are going to say that it returns tablet but also we should make it see out so it matches everything else right so we say see out tablet and line return tablet like that okay so now when we go ahead and write that function then the code compiles because that is no longer an abstract class so this is good because now what you can do is when you're writing your functions and for for the sort of the commonly shared class you know if you want to make sure that that all of the inherited classes have this shared function however you don't you you know that each of those functions are going to be different you know they're going to be different but you need to have a function like they're different but you need to have it so you need to have a get type function that returns the type of the class. You know that each one's gonna do something different, like one's returning PC, one's returning tablet, one's returning smartphone, but you want, you're sort of putting the requirement for the habit. That's exactly what you're doing by making this pure virtual function, which is sort of like a to-do list. Like, okay, I know that I am gonna to have to write this function inside, 
in this class, but I'm not going to do it yet. It's going to be done by the derived classes. Does having the virtual and tablet class do anything to the function? Uh, oh, because I forgot to put it here. Uh, no, because it turns out that vir virtual, as I said last class, propagates down the path of like the client inheritance. So like if a parent class lists something as virtual, they're always going to be virtual. So in this case, it's kind of redundant. Like it's there, but it, it makes no difference in this case because already up here, we made it virtual. So nope, in this case, as you can see, it compiles, that's fine, but it was quite unnecessary. And frankly, it might be confusing to keep it there actually. So, you know, but hey, I'm kind of glad I put it there by accident. So yeah, okay. But yeah, it has no change, no, no modification. So virtuals are very, very important that you guys understand. And so, Let's talk a little bit about terminology when it comes to virtuals. We'll come back to this example because there's more that I want to do with it. But first, let's switch to a clean slate here so that I can uh, talk a little bit about terminology of this stuff. And so, uh, an abstract class is a class that it has at least one pure virtual function. Okay? So, if we have a class, we're just, I'm just going to make a class called A. And in this class A, somewhere I have a function that is pure virtual. By, in this case, let's put the word virtual in front, right? Because I've been putting it in here, but I want to show you that C++ is okay with either way. So uh, there we go. This is a abstract class now, okay? And I cannot create an object of this class until I define what the uh, pure virtual function is in a derived class, okay? And so... This is actually more than just an abstract class. This is also in C++, the changes for Java and other languages, is known as an interface, okay? So, interface. Oh, I did not mean to put it there, I meant to put it here. So what's the difference between an interface and an abstract class? The, the differences are, are sort of just a jargon, per se. The difference being that an abstract class is a mixture of regular functions and pure virtual functions. If you have a class that has just regular functions and pure virtual functions in it like that, so maybe there's also like a, like a void bar, but that was like a real function, so there's a body to it. Body can be empty, but it's, it, it's a body. Then that means that this is just known as abstract. But one that just has all pure virtual functions is known as an interface. Strictly C++ jargon, this means totally different things in Java, okay? In Java, there's no such thing as multiple inheritance. So if you're trying to do that, they have these special fun classes that are called interfaces, which kind of work like this as well, but it's a little bit different. So don't be misled if you're, if you're then coding in Java, okay? So does everybody understand, I hope, the difference between interface and abstract, just from a terminology standpoint of view? If you have variables technically speaking inside an interface now it becomes an abstract class so even without this here this would be considered abstract and not interface because of this here okay so um yeah there's not much more i want to say just about that just know i guess the difference between those two terms uh, abstract class and it's not just interface it's not called interface class mm, yeah yeah that's pretty much it that's all i wanted to say there so um, in addition to that, let's take this moment here to talk about the disk pointer. So because again, if I don't talk about it at some point, I'll forget. So what is a disk pointer? You might have heard before disk pointer. You might have seen it in code. Uh, it turns out that every class has a reference to itself. What that means is that when you are trying to access member variables in a class, such as the index that you see here, or if there was like an int y beneath it, how this is stored in memory is very much like how arrays are stored. There's a certain order that things are stored in, and there's usually the order matches the order that you're writing code in. So like if I have these three variables here, odds are that they're gonna be stored in memory like this one first, and then immediately after that, this one, and immediately after that, this one, all together. So this is kind of like a mini array that's kind of kept in memory. That's actually how it's being stored in, uh, in memory. And so 
just like with arrays, you have a you you have the the pointer of the array actually just pointing to the first element of the array. That's that's all that that it is, right? It doesn't point to the middle, it doesn't point to the end. It points to the beginning of it. So the first the first element. That's what if you're trying to if you were to the reference an array, uh, you would see that it's literally pointing to the first spot, whether it's static array or dynamically allocated array. Okay, so for Purposes of like the compiler to figure out how to access your own class local variables What it does is it adds manually a reference to to, to, the, to the beginning of the class and that is known as the this pointer So the this pointer is a reference to yourself and by yourself I mean to your to the class that it's being called upon so sometimes while we normally would write code like x equals 5 or c out y or z gets y or something like that we are referring to the class variables, right? To the member variables. You can also go ahead and be, use the this pointer and use the arrow operator. Or you could also, I suppose, use the dot if you wanted to use the dereferencing. So like this, you could do that too. But this is this 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 pointer is a is, is just another way to clarify to the compiler that you are talking about the X inside of the class okay now when can this actually be useful uh, one of the examples where it can be useful is if i have a local variable of the same name in the same scope in this case if i said x equals five scoping rules say that it checks from the closest scope all the way until the global scope and in the case of a class or a function inside a class it checks the function's local scope then it then it goes into the parameters of the function see that scope as well if there was like an int x inside of here and then it goes to the class scope checking the member variables and then it would go to the next scope which in this case is the global scope right and so if you're trying to access this x instead instead of this x this will not work you need one of two things you can either i believe this will work by putting the class name in the scope scope resolution operator but you can also use the this pointer like that okay so this pointer is useful primarily for these reasons I discourage you from just throwing this in like this because it's unnecessarily complicating it frankly but like I said some scenarios could be useful something that we really haven't talked about but I would like to talk about someday is pointer arithmetic the concept of pointer arithmetic um, which is very important to know but uh, I think we could definitely spend a good half an hour talking about that at some point because it could be very useful to uh, to know in general. Um, who knows? Maybe maybe I did a class today or something because you kind of have. Yeah, it, it's a good thing to know. All right, so we'll get it. But I really want to focus on the virtuals first now. Okay. So, um, anyways, that was this pointer. Now let's go back to the big example. Okay. So we got our big example here. I'm going to go ahead and just get rid of the tablet class just because like the code is already too big as it is now. So uh, I'd rather not like make it longer or bigger than it is. And I'm also going to move that there, move that there, move that. Oh, not that one. That's just too nasty there. And what else can I do? I guess I can do this, and then I can put this up here like this. Okay, so that's uh, quite frankly disgusting, but hey, we gain some space. If if if, uh, if you're trying to impress someone, be like, oh, I wrote my code in less lines of code. <laughs> you could always do this horrible thing and say, hey, look, I wrote this in very few lines of code. But no, no. or if you're getting paid by the line, then you would want to. <laughs> you space it out in a very crazy way but okay so all right what what is one advantage of doing this sort of shared system that i've done here okay and this is where um you really are going to see the power of virtuals and what is known as polymorphism okay which i'll define in a minute here so for now i am going to go ahead and make an array okay i'm going to make it dynamic because why not dynamically allocated array has been pointers and stuff good practice for the test on uh, next week so I'm gonna call my array. Uh, it's first of all, it's gonna be an array of pointers, and the type of pointer is actually going to be of the abstract class. 
so it's going to be called my um, cabinet, I suppose. That's where I store all my electronic devices, okay? And I'm going to allocate a array of computer pointers. I suppose in that case, this is gonna to have to be double. And that is going to be of size, um, I don't know, it's pretty small. Let's make five devices, okay? Or actually, no, let's go, let's go big. Go big or go home, all right? So uh, after we do that, we are going to initialize them. You know what? I kind of want to use vectors for some reason. Let's do vectors. We don't do vectors as much as we always do. And plus, then I can practice for range for loops. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, let's do vectors. It's a good review for the test, actually. So, um, in this case, we're going to make the vector of computer pointers. And we're going to still call it cabinet. And um, yeah, that's it. So now uh, we'll just throw things in as we go. So if we want to throw in like just just a null pointer in there, we could. We could say something like, you know, I'm going to call it C just to, uh, to, to make the code writing faster, okay? C for cabinet. So if I want to insert something, I could insert like a null pointer like that. You know, be good to go. Uh, in fact, I can insert multiple of those. Okay, let's just compile just to make sure that I'm not crazy. There we go. Okay, so uh, now let's actually insert in here some of the uh, stuff that we already have here. Okay, so um, and technically speaking, I because these are not dynamically allocated, then I gotta be careful about that because if they were, I wouldn't want to mix dynamic stuff and non-dynamic stuff because then you can't you can't easily uh, deallocate it it just becomes a mess. So don't really mix dynamic and non-dynamic in the same array or data structure unless you have an easy way of identifying them. So just, just a FYI, a little tip. But uh, all right, let's go ahead and insert in here our desktop first. So we're gonna put the desktop there. And then after that, maybe we put another null, you know, cause you know, there's like empty spots in our cabinet along with our devices. And then let's go ahead and insert um, the smartphone. Technically speaking, we're, even though the, the smartwatch and the smartphone are linked, it's Bluetooth, so the smartwatch could be outside. But uh, we're going to also put it inside as well, okay? So C dot pushback. Uh, oh, actually, I, I made a mistake. Don't insert the name of the, cl the class. Name it, insert the name of the object. So that's a pixel technically is here. And also here, it's not desktop, but, but PC. Okay, so we got all three things in here, and maybe at the end we put yet another null. Okay, so think about this for a minute. I'm doing some casting here because the cabinet has computer pointers, the super class, right? But I'm storing stuff of derived classes, right? So I'm storing a PC, I'm storing a basically a computer, I'm storing a PC, a smartphone, and a smartwatch, right? So am I doing upcasting or downcasting? Technically speaking, I am upcasting because I am casting child objects up to the parent type, okay? So uh, more important here and cool is the fact that in 135, they told you arrays, are homogeneous data structures, meaning that they can only store one type of data. All integers, all doubles, or floats, all of the same struct type, all of the same class type in this class you learn, uh, and so on. What you can't do is you can't store an int and a double in the same array, or, um, or an object in there as well. They ought to be the same type, right? Homogeneous versus heterogeneous, right? Well, I'm about to show you that that doesn't have to be the case when you're doing this object-oriented design approach. Because look at this. I am storing in the same array. It's an array of pointers, sure, but still, those pointers are all of the same type. So technically speaking, the array is homogeneous because it's all computer pointers. In this case, it's a vector, but we know vectors are really just arrays, just cool arrays. 
But you can do this with dynamic allocated memory or even with a static array as well. What is cool is because of the casting, that all I'm holding in the array are addresses. And these addresses are pointing to completely different objects of different types. They all, however, share one common class, which is the computer class. That is very, very important. Not, not because I can't store anything, because I could actually use reinterpret cast and store an integer into this array. Uh, I can show you that very fast. If I have an integer here, I could store this into my array by saying C push back and then casting that integer, the address of that integer by using reinterpret cast. The, the last of the cast, remember the YOLO cast, into a computer pointer. It's a terrible thing to do because while you can do it, once it's there, uh, you don't know what is happening. Uh, no matching function call to computer pointer, pushback, smartwatch. Oh, I, I wrote the ampersand after the, I don't know how that happened. Uh, oh, I just forgot to put the ampersand. Ampersand here and ampersand here. There we go. And then one more error. I am missing a, a parentheses of some sort. Probably amongst this mess. Let's see where that is. Line 28. So C dot pushback. C dot pushback pixel. C dot pushback. I watch. No. I don't see it. Must be on the line above it. Must be amongst this thing. I'm, I'm probably screwed this up. Computer pointer address of X. I'm not sure. Let me get rid of this and see if, it, if that's causing it. Nope. It must be before that. So C dot pushback no. C dot pushback no. Let me spread this out so I can see where the actual error is at. Okay, so now let's try to compile it and see. So it says it's at PC. Ah, because it's not PC, it's HP. That's still the name of the class. There we go. So, all right, so now let's go back to our mess. <laughs> And then maybe this one goes to the next line so you can see it. Okay? That is why you don't want to put your code crushed like that. But here, unfortunately, I have to do that because otherwise I will keep scrolling up and down. And it's just, you guys are going to get nausea. So, yeah. So, anyways, it compiled and I am storing, or it will compile in a minute here. Just got to finish fixing everything. HP was not declaring the scope. What is the name of the, what is the, name of the PC that I made? Uh... Oh, desktop. It's called desktop, not HP. There we go. So it compiled and it runs. And I'm storing in this array, I'm storing objects of computer, of derived classes of computer, and I'm even storing an integer in there. Okay? This is horrible though. Because like once you cast the pointer to be something else, you have you have no information of what it originally was. You can use dynamic cast to check, but you're kind of like guessing in the blind. So this is a terrible thing to do, but it, look at that. The 135 people lied to you. You, you don't have to make homogenous data structures with, with arrays. You can keep whatever you want in them. You just have to make sure you remember in what spot they are, what they are, right? Well, I'm gonna tell you that in, the, in this special scenario, so I'm gonna get rid of this for now, cause uh, you know, I just wanted to show that, but I really don't wanna deal with this now. But in the scenario where all of the different objects are shared amongst the common class, guess what? Now it's going to come into light as to why I made this function called get type. And then I went ahead and actually made took the effort to make it value returning. Because guess what? What do virtuals do? Remember? What did we fix initially with this situation here with the up and down casting right? The reason that we had that we had to use the word virtual to fix this code was because otherwise it was binding the wrong function 
with the wrong call, right? So like, if we had a pointer of a parent class pointing to an object of a child class, but we were not using the keyword virtual, it will call the wrong function from the parent instead of the updated derived function. So it will be calling the foo from the parent instead of from the child, right? But adding all the word virtual, we tell the compiler, hey, don't do this compile time binding at compile time. Do it at runtime by using runtime binding with a V table, which is why virtuals were there, right? So that power of virtual is also here. Because we made this a virtual function to avoid this being an abstract class, we also have the bonus that it's a virtual function, which means that if we call get type on any of these objects, even though they are all with, held with a pointer of the computer class, because of the keyword virtual, it will call the correct object, or sorry, the correct function from the derived classes. So by that I'm saying that if I write a for loop here that says for auto um, i and c, and then I go ahead and say i get type, and then run this like that, check it out. Oh, segmentation fault, great. Hold on, I have to I have to do something here because some of them are null, right? So if i is not equal to null, <laughs> very anticlimactic there with the segmentation fault. But yeah, if i is not equal to null, and there we go. Let me go ahead and comment out the uh, the, the, the get type from or here I'll, I'll just put a print statement here saying uh, cabinet contents. You're not you can't see this, but it's right on it's right where my face is literally. Um, I don't want to put it on its on its own line because otherwise we will run more out of space. But it's 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 like right there. You see that? Okay. So if we run this, ah, uh, come on. What did I do? Cabinet contents and line. Oh, end line. Forgot the L of end line. There we go. We can see cabinet contents, PC, smartwatch, and smartphone. I didn't put anything for the ones that are null. I could do that if I wanted to. I can say else see out null like that. And so then you that way you can see them. So you can see there the ordering now much better. So you can see that we have null, null, PC, null, smartphone, smartwatch, null. Okay? So look at that. I am calling, technically speaking, in line 29 of this code, I am calling the get type function on a computer pointer but because it's virtual it knows that for some of these they're not well first of all the computer is an abstract class but furthermore when I'm calling it on a smartphone object it knows to call the get type function in the smart watch class or in the smartphone class or in the desktop or PC class right so the virtuals is allowing it to figure out that it really is not just a computer object it's actually a smartphone object or a smartwatch object or a desktop object it knows it knows basically okay so that's the power of virtual now the ability of basically being able to use the same expression to uh, what is this oh to uh the ability to to basically use the same expression for uh for, for, for being able to, to, to actually access the other classes, that is actually what polymorphism is. Does that work only because they are pointers in the vector? Uh, well, they could be pointers in, an, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a regular array or a, or a linked list once you learn that. It doesn't, ma it doesn't matter what they are. This works because the pointer is of a common type, which they all share, and that is, that all of these classes, their daddy, you know, their, app, their their super class is computer. And so they all have this get type function. That's why it works. Now, if what you're asking is if it works because they're, I'm holding a pointer instead of holding the actual object in the array, then yes, you are correct. Because the, the array itself is just a bunch of addresses. It's still very fixed size. Uh, in one fact, in one way or the other, the 135 people were true in the sense that they are homogeneous. In this case, all they're holding are addresses, but those addresses are pointing to completely different objects and completely different classes. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and write that down. 
That's why I was trying to read it, because I wanted to read the definition in a very segue manner. But uh, polymorphism is very important. Oh, actually, you know what? If I remember correctly, I think I have it down here. Yeah, I do. Yeah. So I went ahead and wrote it ahead of time. So polymorphism, the ability to use the same expression to denote different operations, right? Different operations because what I'm saying is that I am able to have one function name, such as print, get type, speak. If it was the animal example with the animals, I could make them speak like different animal sounds. Uh, watch that summer lecture, by the way, if you want to see that example. But uh, they all, you know, I don't care how it works. I just know that if I say speak, if I say print, if I say get type, then I will get back the right type or the right sound of the animal. Okay? That is the power of polymorphism. That, you know, in, in C++, when you say C out, and you uh, and you put a variable name in there, you don't need to worry about if it's an integer or a double or a string. The computer handles that and prints it out to the screen regardless of the type. We take that for granted, but it has to figure out what it is before it printed. Otherwise, they would try to print a string as an integer, you know? So that is powerful. That is one of the, the concepts of object-oriented design, and we finally finished our little try for symbol. So going back to like week one or two of the class, the, we, we talked about object-oriented programming and object-oriented design. Uh, so because they are pointers, which are pointing to different places in memory, C++ knows to call the child class version of the functions. That is achieved because of the virtual components. That's, that's why that works, because the virtual says, do not link the pointer to the function ahead of time, at compile time. Wait until runtime when we know what it's actually pointing to, like what the class is, and then figure out which function to call. So that is why that works. So, so you, are, you are in that sense correct. Okay? So uh, that's the, not C, I wasn't going to say C++, but the, the, uh, the runtime system, really. But yeah. Okay. So going back to this, this little Triforce symbol here. We've talked about encapsulation. That was the first thing we talked about with object-oriented design. The, that is the concept of, as, a, as the term says, encapsulate, you know, capsule is to put data and operations of that data together, right? We have a class, we put the data and anything we need to do with that data. So for example, if it's a, rec, if it's a, if it's a shape, geometric shape class, we have a rectangle class, we have a length and the width, and then we have a function called get area or find perimeter or anything like that, right? So. The other concept that we then talked about is inheritance. Inheritance is basically to create something new, a new object from existing code, which basically improves it or adds more to it, which allows you to sort of not have to rewrite code so often, right? So you have that reusability of code, which is very, very powerful, right? So, I mean, you, you saw it even today. I created this computer class that has this function for getting the name and, and, and the, has a string look variables for storing the name. That way I don't have to copy and paste that get name function in every class. I also have the ability to sort of ahead of time design my classes, right? I can, I can use abstract classes to, to design what I want these classes to have. So if I'm designing a, a program and I know that I'm going to, let's say I'm making a video game, right? And I know that I'm going to have a bunch of different different classes of players, but I'm trying to design what they all share. They also have a health meter, like some sort of force meter, uh, some certain attributes like speed and jump height or, or, or a shield and all these things. So I'm designing this ahead of time and I'm also having functions that they can do sort of like jump or move or speak or make this action, save your game, all these things you are setting up ahead of time that are going to be shared. And so with inheritance, once you, and, and abstract classes, once you set it up in the derived classes, you either take advantage that it's already set up, or if it's something like an abstract pure virtual function in an abstract class, you can go ahead and finish defining it. So it's catered to that object, but you know that because they all shared that common class, you know that if there's a function called, you know, um, attack, then, if it's a magician, it's going to throw magic. If it's a sword player, it's going to swing its sword. If it's an archer, it's going to shoot its arrows. 
You don't care about that. You just know that you call the attack button because the player pressed the attack key, that it will work, right? That's the power of virtual functions and inheritance combined. And that brings us, of course, to the third category, which is polymorphism. Power of polymorphism that you don't have to, to worry about how it's done. You say attack and it attacks, whether it's a arch, magic, or whatever, okay? So polymorphism. The, we have completed now or object-oriented design sort of triangle, okay? So, um, yeah, that's that's kind of that. Um, what else do we have in here? So polymorphism, this pointer has the classes. Arrays of pointers is a base class. That's literally what I've done here. This is an array of pointer of the computer class. We now have to talk about virtual inheritance and virtual destructors. So um, for that, I think it might be faster if I show you some prepared code. So I have, um, we still got to talk about the, the diamond problem. Uh, I don't think we can really achieve that in 10 minutes. So we'll probably leave virtual inheritance for next class. Let's talk about virtual destructor. I think that one I can achieve in 10 minutes. Okay. So yeah. Okay, so I will go ahead and post this code. Maybe before I post it, I'll go back and unscrew it up. So like, I'll make it nicely spaced out. Maybe no guarantees. Depends on how how tired I am after the court after the lecture ends in ten minutes. But uh, I'll try and. Uh, I mean, I could just post it like this too. I mean, you've seen it in a nice way. So yeah. But anyways, uh, this one is too basic you don't you don't need to worry about that you can just take a screenshot of this but I, i'd rather use this to show you the virtual destructors so there's a couple of other things uh that uh, virtuals can be useful for uh diamond problem we'll talk about next class again but this one we can do now so let me go ahead and type really fast a scenario where this would be useful let me know if you have other questions by the way um in general, of what I just that big example, because I'd rather do that in, if, if, than do this. If, if you guys have questions, you know. So uh, let me go ahead. And this 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 virtual destructor stuff kind of kind of goes into what we were talking about in that last class with the rule of three. So uh, yeah, it kind of goes into that sort of concept and expands upon it. So uh, here we have a dynamically allocated pointer uh, of, of, of integer here that we allocate in the constructor, um, or in this case, I'm just allocating it there, but ideally you want to do it in the constructor. So maybe we'll do that actually properly. So here we'll say x gets an int, and we will do that, and we'll just make everything public for now. Okay. So uh, yep, that's pretty much it. I this bothers me. I, I like I like putting variables together. So I'll do that. And then basically, B is going to be kind of like the same thing as A, but uh, with another with a different different uh, different object or sorry different different member variable. So we'll put a Y in there. Okay, like that. All right, so um, let me go ahead and make an object of each class. Um, I'm trying to think if I have to make it dynamic for this to run. Let's, uh, eh, we don't have to, so I guess we won't. Okay, so I'm making an object of each one. All right, so I run, I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, no, no, I do have to make it dynamic. Otherwise, this will not work, yes. So let me make him dynamic. New A and then B. New B. What I'm trying to cause is a situation that's going to cause a problem. Okay. I don't want to tell you at a time because climax. Exciting. Let me uh, switch over to what is this? Dynamic six. Oh no, poly. By the way, the names of the of the um, the names of all of the file names are totally random most of the time like at some point they used to be related to the topic but i just i mean they kind of are like that in this case i was thinking like oh i'm gonna do polymorphism example here or that din for dynamic allocation example but that's not always the case so don't always just assume that it actually is for a reason 
Okay. But I do have, I give them a name so you can identify them easier. So perfect. Um, actually, not perfect. We shouldn't have had memory leaks at this point. Oh, well, I have to put the deletes because it's dynamic. But delete A, delete B. Okay. So I, 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 you see memory leaks there. And then if I uh, rerun this again with dial grinds, then you see no memory leaks, right? Magic. Yay. Okay, cool. So now let's go ahead and do that whole up and down casting stuff and cause some issues here, okay? So what I'm going to do is I am going to first do something good and then do something bad. So let's go ahead and now let's jump straight for the bad. So when we make the object of B here, I am going to keep that in a pointer of A by calling it fake A, all right? And so here is the issue. If I run this, this should still be okay, right? You might think like, ooh, polymorphism or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a, of course, is getting deallocated, that's no problem. The issue here is that I am upcasting by storing a B object in an A pointer, so there's the upcasting going on there, and I'm calling delete, right? Well, this is the same issue with a different phase, but we are having a memory leak. The reason we're having a memory leak in this scenario is the same reason why in this example we had issues with the fake dad and the sun thing, because compile time binding. Compile time binding also applies to destructors, okay? And I, this, I like to make this one a specific example because people always forget about this one, uh, or you don't think about it until like it happens and then you're like, oh. And that is that, again, compile time binding, when you're calling a function, we saw that it, you know, it, you can fool the compiler at compile time. If, if, if you have a pointer of a parent class pointing to a child object, and it might call the wrong function, right? <laughs> so we, we fix that with virtual. The same thing can happen with a constructor and destructor. But specifically here with a destructor, it's not as obvious because, like, you're not physically calling the destructor. You don't usually call, while you can, highly discouraged to do so, but you don't usually call the destructor explicitly. Like I don't, I don't go and say something like a uh, like that. Because while this will work, it's bad to do this. Okay, like don't do that. It's bad. Instead, you call delete, which will then call the destructor like automatically, right? Well, here's the problem: when you call delete on on fake a it turns out that this is at compile time is linking it to the destructor of the pointer type of A, which happens to be this destructor. So delete fake A is actually calling the destructor of the A class and when it should be calling the destructor of the B class because fake A is holding a B. And so the destructor of the A class is deallocating this variable, but Y never gets deallocated. And there's your problem. What is your solution? Virtuals, a virtual destructor. Um, actually, I think it would be better to put it under the, I think here? Can't, that I don't remember which one you should put it on. Let's try it there. I think that one will be okay. Uh, expect the class name before virtual. Oh, the little curly bracket is part of the function name itself, so you actually want to do it like that. Hold on. Compile and dog run. And there we go. No problems. Let me just show you side side. Let me get rid of virtual yet again one more time. Save, compile, and Valgrind. So save, Valgrind, memory leak there. Write the word virtual, compile, memory leak, gone. Okay? So you can see that we have eliminated this problem. Get another example of compile time binding versus runtime binding that in this case applies to the structures. But this one's very easy to miss because again, you don't usually call the destructor explicitly. So you might assume that it's working when you have the same issues as before. Okay. And this could potentially happen with constructors, but that's more, that's more of like, that wouldn't happen in the wild unless you were trying to do something bad. Whereas this is a common mistake to do. So it's, I, I like to point it out. So that is virtual destructors. So you can guarantee that I am putting that in the test. And whether you get the question or not, we don't know because it's that we're making a test pool of questions. So people in other classes might get that question. So then we'll see how they do. So uh, 
that's it. I don't want to talk about virtual inheritance, like I said, because that will take a little bit longer and it's already time. But T, we managed to do virtual destructs in 10 minutes, nine minutes. So not bad. So uh, yeah, uh, any questions about what we went over today or in general? Uh, FYI, your test is happening uh, next Thursday during your designated like test time, which is during 1 to 2.15, I think. So uh, be prepared for that. We will be having normal class on Monday. And then Wednesday, we will probably do some sort of review. That'll be optional for you if you want to come or not. I mean, it's beneficial, but it's a little bit different because, like I said, I'm not making the test myself. Like, I am contributing to the test banks, but it's going to be test banks made. Just like the assignments, they're going to be made by all of the other people teaching 202, which uh, will be interesting because we'll get to see how, uh, how we're doing compared to the other sections. So Monday, we will dedicate on talking more about virtuals. And any other things that I might have missed as well. On Valgrind, when it says six allocations and five frees, why is alloc why, which alloc is not freed and why is not memory leak? Because sometimes they don't line up because when you deallocate something, it it might out deallocate like like let's say you're deallocating like an entire array. You know, that's one deallocation. But you might have allocated that array in different parts. Like, if, if you think about that big example we did today, imagine that I've made the smartphone and the smartwatch dynamically. Like, if I've allocated those dynamically. So I could have done that in, like, three different allocations. One for the PC, sorry, one for the desktop, one for the iWatch, and one for the uh, Pixel, right? So those are three individual allocations that I've made. Had I made this um, this array dynamically, I could have potentially deallocated all three in one go. And so that's why sometimes the allocations, the freeze and the delete don't match, but you don't technically have memory leaks, okay? Not the best example, but there's only one that I can think of right now, but it's okay. However, um, it if you have if you do have memory leaks, and you see that your allocations and your freeze don't match, then, then that could also be one of the reasons why. So while there are some cases where it is okay for them not to match, it is a sign that if your memory leak is, is if you're having memory leaks and those don't match, that is a sign that it might be not be not be one of those cases where they don't match. It might be because you actually screwed something up. Okay? So uh, it's not always a problem, but it can be signs of problems if you do have memory leaks. So that's that's kind of the the uh, the uh, correct answer without saying something wrong, I suppose. Cool. Uh, could we get a small page of topics to read for the exam, or is that what, what we will be doing on Wednesday? So on Wednesday we will do the topic stuff, but I will probably so so what I've done in the past, and I I would have released already, but I don't know is I have a. I have a little a little uh, canvas page that talks about the topics, right? And oh, cut the heads for. And uh, I can kind of show you that very fast here, actually, if you give me a second. I think this will line it up. So this is what I normally have. I have it actually hidden because this is the old one from the summer. But uh, this is, would have been like the test that I would have made, right? So, and then I had like this, uh, I guess this was not from summer. This was from the fall, I guess, 2019, where I have topics, right? So what I'll do is I'll try to give you something like this updated to what we're doing now. But it's a little bit tricky because, again, I'm not the one making the test. So uh, I can't, I can't, you know, I don't want to lie to you and say something's going to be in the test when it's not. The way we're doing the test is... I created these test banks on different topics and the topics are like I have here classes one of them for pointers I believe one for inheritance one for virtuals and I think one generic one I think those are all of them but if not like I said I'll go over in Wednesday because hopefully by Wednesday they everything is set up right for the test and so I made the, I made the test banks and what we're gonna do is we're gonna like pull like X amount of questions from each of the test banks so that the test is fair and you don't get like 
20 questions on pointers and zero questions on like inheritance, right? So I'll try and give you the, uh, what I can do is, I mean, I will, I will list you those lists of, those list of, uh, of topics, but like I said, I think that's all of them. I'm not, I think I'm missing any of them. I've literally looked at the syllabus topics and make those test banks, but I can't tell you like more detail. Like for example, I can be like, there's going to be a virtual inheritance question or sorry, uh, not a, a, a virtual destructive question because I'm making a question on that topic. But because it's RNG from the test bank, you may not get that question. You might, but you may also not get it. So that's, uh, that I, I can't go further than that. Normally I would really like almost go on a question per question basis and be like, tell you the topic of each question on the, on the review day. Not tell you what the question is, but I will tell you the topic. Like this is a virtual inheritance question. This is a, uh, allocating array question. Uh, this is like a, a ver you know, um, uh, there's an ex example of doing inheritance or a multiple inheritance question. I will do that, but this time I can't because the test will be different for each person. So that's good because it prevents cheating, but it's bad because, uh, it's harder to review for it. So we'll do our best. So really Wednesday will be dedicated to answering questions on things that you might want more review of. Like, Somebody asked, I think last class, about the difference between the dot and the arrow operator, right? So we can review that if that's what you guys want. That time will be your time to ask questions. And I'll probably do like a 10 minute quick review of what I think would be useful, but that's it. So that's a long explanation. So anyways, I'll see you, you know, I hope you guys have a good weekend and I'll see you on uh, Monday so we can finish talking about virtuals. Get your assignments uh, complete. So, see ya.